JDB v. North Carolina Supreme Court, 2012. Justice Sotomayor delivered the opinion of the court. This case presents the question whether the age of a child subjected to police questioning is relevant to the custody analysis of Miranda v. Arizona. It is beyond dispute that children will often feel bound to submit to police questioning when an adult in the same circumstances would feel free to leave seeing no reason for police officers or courts to blind themselves to that common sense reality, we hold that a child's age properly informs the Miranda custody analysis. One, petitioner JDB was a 13 year old seventh grade student attending class at Smith Middle School in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, when he was removed from his classroom by a uniformed police officer, escorted to a closed door conference room and questioned by police for at least half an hour. This was the second time that police questioned JDB in the span of a week. Five days earlier, two home break-ins occurred and various items were stolen. Police stopped and questioned JDB after he was seen behind a residence in the neighborhood where the crimes occurred. That same day, police also spoke to JDB's grandmother, his legal guardian, as well as his aunt. Police later learned that a digital camera matching the description of one of the stolen items had been found at JDB's middle school and seen in JDB's possession. Investigator Di Costanzo, the juvenile investigator with the local police force who had been assigned to the case, went to the school to question JDB. Upon arrival, Di Costanzo informed the uninformed, excuse me, Di Costanzo informed the uniformed police officer on detail at the school, a so-called school resource officer, the assistant principal, and the administrative intern that he was there to question JDB about break-ins. Although Di Costanzo asked the school administrators to verify JDB's date of birth, address, and parent contact information from school records, neither the police officers nor the school administrators contacted JDB's grandmother. The uniformed officer interrupted JDB's afternoon social studies class, removed JDB from the classroom, and escorted him to a school conference room. There, JDB was met by Di Costanzo, the assistant principal, and the administrative intern. The door to the conference room was closed. With the two police officers and the two administrators present, JDB was questioned for the next 30 to 45 minutes. Prior to the commencement of questioning, JDB was given, given neither Miranda warnings nor the opportunity to speak to his grandmother, nor was he informed that he was free to leave the room. Questioning began with small talk. talk. Discussion of sports and JDB's family life. Di Costanzo asked, and JDB agreed, to discuss the events of the prior weekend. Denying any wrongdoing, JDB explained that he had been in the neighborhood where the crimes occurred because he was seeking work mowing lawns. Di Costanzo pressed JDB for additional detail about his efforts to obtain work, asked JDB to explain a prior incident when one of the victims returned home to find JDB behind her house and confronted JDB with the stolen camera. The assistant principal urged JDB to do the right thing, warning JDB that the truth always comes out in the end. Eventually, JDB asked whether he would still be in trouble if he'd returned the stuff. In response, D. Costanzo explained that return of the stolen items would be helpful, but this thing is going to court regardless. D. Costanzo then warned that he may need to seek a secure custody order if he believed that JDB would continue to break into other homes. When JDB asked what a secure custody order was, D. Costanzo explained that it's where you get sent to juvenile detention before court. After learning of the prospect of juvenile detention, JDB confessed that he and a friend were responsible for the break-ins. D. Costanzo only then informed JDB that he could refuse to answer the investigator's questions and that he was free to leave. Asked whether he understood, JDB nodded and provided further detail, including information about the location of the stolen items. Eventually, JDB wrote a statement that at D. Costanzo's request. When the bell rang indicating the end of the school day, JDB was allowed to leave to catch the bus home. Two juvenile petitions were filed against JDB, each alleging one count of breaking and entering and one count of larceny. JDB's public defender moved to suppress his statements and the evidence derived therefrom, arguing that suppression was necessary because JDB had been interrogated by police in a custodial setting without being afforded Miranda warnings, and because his statements were involuntary under the totality of the circumstances test. 
After a suppression hearing at which D. Costanzo and JDB testified, the trial court denied the motion, deciding that JDB was not in custody at the time of the schoolhouse interrogation and that his statements were voluntary. Two, any police interview of an individual suspected of a crime has a coercive aspect to it. Only those interrogations that occur while a suspect is in police custody, however, heighten the risk that statements obtained are not the product of the suspect's free choice. By its very nature, custodial police interrogation entails inherently compelling pressures, even for an adult. The physical and psychological isolation of custodial interrogation can undermine the individual's will to resist and compel him to speak where he would not otherwise do so freely. Indeed, the pressure of custodial interrogation is so immense that it can include a frighteningly high percentage of people to confess to crimes they never committed. That risk is all the more troubling, and recent studies suggest all the more accurate when the subject of custodial interrogation is a juvenile. Recognizing that the inherently coercive nature of custodial interrogation blurs the line between voluntary and involuntary statements, this court in Miranda adopted a set of prophylactic measures designed to safeguard the constitutional guarantee against self-incrimination. Because these measures protect the individual against the coercive nature of custodial interrogation, they are required only where there has been such a restriction on a person's freedom as to render him in custody. As we have repeatedly emphasized, whether a suspect is in custody is an objective inquiry. The benefit of the objective custody analysis is that it is designed to give clear guidance to the police. The state and its amici contend that a child's age has no place in the custody analysis, no matter how young the child is subjected to police questioning. We cannot agree. In some circumstances, a child's age would have a would have affected how a reasonable person in the suspect's position would perceive his or her freedom to leave. That is, a reasonable child subjected to police questioning will sometimes feel pressured to submit when a reasonable adult would feel free to go. We think it clear that courts can account for that reality without doing any damage to the objective nature of the custody analysis. A child's age is far more than a chronological fact. It is a fact that generates common sense conclusions about behavior and perception. Such conclusions apply broadly to children as a class, and they are self-evident to anyone who was a child once himself, including any police officer or judge. Time and again, this court has drawn these common sense conclusions for itself. We've observed that children generally are less mature and responsible than adults, and they often lack the experience, perspective, and judgment to recognize and avoid choices that could be detrimental to them, that they are more vulnerable or susceptible to outside pressures than adults, and so on. Addressing the specific context of police interrogation, we have observed that events that would leave a man cold and unimpressed can overawe and overwhelm a lad in his early teens. Describing no one child in particular, these observations restate what any parent knows, indeed what any person knows, about children generally. Our various statements to this effect are far from unique. The law has historically reflected the same assumption that children characteristically lack the capacity to exercise mature judgment and possess only an incomplete ability to understand the world around them. Indeed, even where a reasonable person standard otherwise applies, the common law has reflected the reality that children are not adults. In negligence suits, for instance, where liability turns on what an objectively reasonable person would do in the circumstances, all American jurisdictions accept the idea that a person's childhood is a relevant circumstance to be considered. As this discussion establishes, our history is replete with laws and judicial recognition that children cannot be viewed simply as miniature adults. We see no justification for taking a different course here, so long as the child's age was known to the officer at the time of the interview or would have been objectively apparent to any reasonable officer. Including age as part of the custody analysis requires officers neither to consider circumstances unknowable to them, nor to anticipate the frailties or idiosyncrasies of the particular suspect whom they question. The same wide basis of community experience that makes it possible as an objective matter to determine what is to be expected of children in other contexts, likewise makes it possible to know what to expect of children subjected to police questioning. In fact, in many cases involving juvenile suspects, the custody analysis would be nonsensical absent some consideration of the suspect's age. This case is a prime example. 
where the court precluded from taking JDB's youth into account, it would be forced to evaluate the circumstances present here through the eyes of a reasonable person of average years. In other words, how would a reasonable adult understand his situation after being removed from a seventh grade social class, social studies class by a uniformed school resource officer, being encouraged by his assistant principal to do the right thing, and being warned by a police investigator of the prospect of juvenile detention and separation from his guardian and primary caretaker. To describe such an inquiry is to demonstrate its absurdity. Neither officers nor courts can reasonably evaluate the effect of objective circumstances that, by their nature, are specific to children without accounting for the age of the child subjected to those circumstances. Indeed, although the dissent suggests that concerns regarding the application of Miranda custody rule to minors can be accommodated by considering the unique circumstances present when minors are questioned in school, the effect of the schoolhouse setting cannot be disentangled from the identity of the person questioned. A student whose presence at school is compulsory and whose disobedience at school is cause for disciplinary action and is, a, is in a far different position than, say, a parent volunteer on school grounds to chaperone an event, or an adult from the community on school grounds to attend a basketball game. Without asking whether the person questioned in school is a minor, the coercive effect of the schoolhouse setting is unknowable. Reviewing the question de novo today, we hold that so long as the child's age was known to the officer at the time of police questioning, or would have been objectively apparent to a reasonable officer, its inclusion in the custody analysis is consistent with the objective nature of that test. That is, not to say that a child's age will be a determinative or even significant factor in every case. It is, however, a reality that courts cannot simply ignore. The question remains whether JDB was in custody when police interrogated him. We remand for the state courts to address that question, this time taking account of all the relevant circumstances of the interrogation, including JDB's age at the time.